yourself in the mirror and accept that if you weren't a racist, you condone what a racist did. So that's to me the same thing. It's the same thing. So I, I agree with you. Big show, you got a big following. So uh, God bless you. I appreciate it. Hey folks, the man with the pinky ring and the New York thing. Forget about it. Bad Brad Berkwood. And you're watching another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood show on the Ringside Report web TV channel. Now, follow me on Twitter as well at Bad Brad RSR. Again, it's at Bad Brad RSR. Well, hey, folks, we're getting a ton of snow today. I don't know how you are doing in your area and your parts of the world, but we are getting probably four to six to 10 inches of snow. Forget about it. But we're still going to do a show. And today I have a lady who is an actress, a painter, a humanitarian, and as well, she is a daughter of one of my favorite all-time actors and my father's as well for many years. When I grew up, he used to turn me on to his movies and then I became a big fan. She is the daughter of the legendary actor, John Garfield. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to my show, Julie Garfield. Okay. Well, first of all, Julie, I want to welcome you to the show. Thank you for coming on today. Thank you for inviting me. And you're in my home uh, state of New York. You're in my, uh, my favorite place, New York City. And folks, we talked a little bit before we started shooting. Uh, your temperature there is what today? Oh, my gosh. Uh, today, it was like 58. 58. Okay. Yeah. Debbie got me to pull out the shovel. Uh, even though I don't shovel snow, we got someone that comes to do it. But just in case I got to shovel a walkway for the dogs to go out, we're getting, <laughs> we're getting nailed, nailed with, with snow. Well, wow. what I would like to do is, like I told you before we started shooting, I always do 360s of my guests to give my viewers a, a complete um, view into you as a human being and, and stuff like that. So since it's your first time coming on, I always start out with asking people over the last two years with COVID going on, and especially in New York, you guys got hit so hard at the very beginning. How have you been coping? Any personal stories, anything you could pass on for people dealing with stress with COVID that you could share? Yes, I could. I've been very lucky. Um, I was supposed to have a one woman show and I had to prepare for it. And just as my husband and I had moved to, we have a house on a lake in, uh, in upper New York. And just as we moved there, I was going to prepare for the show. And um, so then the virus hit. And well, I was lucky enough to be in a place where I have a large area to paint in. And I just continued with my work. I mean, we, we, we couldn't go anywhere. We couldn't see anyone. Uh, we had our food delivered. And I was able to work with a very great painter who um, helped me and consulted with me. And so I just kept continuing with my work on my paintings. And then of course the show was canceled. And then the show was rescheduled. And then the show was canceled again. And hopefully um, we'll have the show maybe in the fall, we'll see. Okay, How, how's establishments there? Are you dealing with in the city? Are they mass mandates or, or how, how's it working in the city as far as with COVID stuff? In the city, it's wonderful. Everybody obeys the rules there. In nice the country, place. in Putnam County, they don't obey the rules. However, we were lucky enough to have a supermarket to go to where they do. And we were lucky enough to get food delivered to us there. And I could get my canvases and paint supplies delivered there also. So, um, uh, you know, most of the time I was doing that, uh, just painting and then watching TV. And sometimes we went a little bit nuts, but um, my husband is a fantastic guy. And, uh, you know, if I want to be locked up with anybody, I want to be locked up with him. So, <laughs> okay. not that. <laughs> okay, great. Well, yeah. we're going to start at the beginning. And I always tell all of my guests that we know that the internet is not always correct for information. 
So if I have something wrong in my notes from doing research, please don't hesitate to say, hey, Brad, it's actually this. I'm not offended by that because I like my interviews to be as factually correct for the viewers as they can be. Okay. Okay. So yeah. it, it looks like you grew up in New York City. So since New York City is, is someplace that I absolutely want to go back to and I love, talk about growing up in New York City. Oh my God, I love New York City. Now, I, I was a very lucky kid. I mean, well, it was terrible what happened to my father. And I do remember living in this incredible apartment when my father was alive, where you could actually see the Thanksgiving Day Parade outside of your window and you could see Central Park. And then when he died, uh, we moved to Riverside Drive and we lived there for a couple of years. But then I was so lucky that my mother married this wonderful man, Sidney Cohn. And Sydney was a labor lawyer and became a very important uh, motion picture lawyer. He represented a lot of actors, great actors, Paul Newman, Meryl Streep, a lot of people, and uh, Zero Mostel. And uh, he was so kind to me and to my brother and treated us as if we were his. And uh, we moved to Central Park West and we lived there. and. I went to high school uh, at Fieldston High School where I had to take the subway to go there. It took quite a while to get there. And uh, so I guess I was a lucky kid. And also my mother was so cultured. And so, so we had, a, for instance, we had a, my mother had a box at Carnegie Hall. So we could go and hear the beautiful concerts and uh, we would go to see the great ballets. We would, I saw the Nureyev, I saw Ulanova, I saw Polisetskaya, I saw all the musicals on Broadway. I was a very lucky kid and uh, that was my childhood growing up. The only problem with uh, everything was that I was so distressed by the death of my father that that hung over everything in my life and I had a lot of problems getting over that. Okay. And we're going to talk about your paintings in a little while, which, you know, I told you, I just, I love them. But for the viewers, that's your mom in the painting behind you, correct? That's my mom. Beautiful painting. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful woman. Beautiful she painting. She so beautiful. I love that. Gorgeous, yeah. gorgeous, gorgeous painting. Okay. Now, we're going to get into your acting and stuff. But I'm curious, did you get into acting because of your dad? Uh, that he was in it? I, mean, I know, I know he, he passed when you were very young. But what made you get into acting? Oh, I was a very artistic kid. I, I, I was a multi-talented kid and I was very lucky to be at Fieldston where they encouraged that kind of thing. I had a gorgeous voice. I starred in all the plays, but I was also very involved in being an artist. And I had a wonderful teacher of art there. So I, I excelled in all of the arts at school. Okay. All right. It looks like in, in 71, you won a Theater World and Variety Drama Critics Award for your performance as Sonia in the Roundabout Theater production of Chekhov's Uncle Vanya. Am I pronouncing that right? You are. Very good. Okay. Talk about that. Um, it was a very strange experience. Um, I wanted very much to, to get cast in that play. And um, an actress named Stockard Channing got the part. And they fired her and called me. And I only had two weeks to rehearse. And I was so shocked when I opened and the entire New York was talking about me as if I was some kind of a genius. I was called a young Eleanor Aduza. Um, it was all these people came to see me. And uh, it was a frightening experience for me. Instead of being wonderful, it was scary because I think I felt like I didn't know how I was going to be able to duplicate that again. And um, I went on to the show closed and we opened in a little theater and off Broadway. And then the, the show uh, just wasn't selling. So we closed up. And I kind of walked away from that feeling like, oh my God, how am I ever going to be able to do that again? Instead of being able to be excited about the next project, I really lost my self-confidence. And i uh, I retreated a little bit. Okay. You had, you had mentioned um, Zero Mostel, and I want to talk about a film that you had a part in, which, interesting enough, 
talked about, I mean, not your dad's particular, but what he went through. And it was, and I saw this movie um, with my dad in the seventies and 1976 was the Woody Allen movie, The Front. Right. And Daryl Mostel was in that movie. You had a role in that movie as well. And if I remember correctly, I think Zero Mostel jumped off a building or out of a window in the movie, I think. I, I think he did because he was blacklisted. But um, you mentioned Zero and you also um, were in a play with Zero as well called The um, the Merchant. Yeah, it was called right. The Merchant. And then you were in that movie with him. I know The Merchant came before The Front. I'm just curious, did, was, the, did Zero merchant, get you? Go ahead. The Front. The merchant came after the front. Oh, came after the front. Okay, came after the front. Talk, talk the about front. the front and the merchant. The front was about um, an actor who was starring in the Molly Goldberg show. And it was, about, it was a true, based on a true story about that man whose name I've just forgotten because, oh dear. And um, he was in the Molly Goldberg show, which was a huge hit. And he was blacklisted and they wouldn't allow him to continue in the show. And he had a son that was mentally disturbed and this son had to be institutionalized. And this was a very sad story because in those days they would put people in these horrible hospitals, really horrible. So when he was fired from the Molly Goldberg show, he couldn't afford to keep his son in a really nice place. His son had to be put into a state-run horror place. And he then rented a, a hotel room and um, jumped out of a window and committed suicide. The front was supposed to be about that man. And what happened is that Martin Ritt, who was directing the film, couldn't raise the money to make the film. And Woody Allen came along and he said, look, I'll, I'll do the film with you. And we can do two stories. One will be about the actor who I can't believe I can't remember his name right now. And the other will be about me as a blacklisted writer. And so they, they cut the deal and uh, we all got jobs in the film. And there were a whole bunch of blacklisted actors, kids and writers, kids who were in the film. And I had a tiny little part. Um, so I, I didn't have a lot to do. Um, and, but Zero, you know, he was a friend of the family and uh, on and off, we always saw him. And Zero had a lot of troubled times with very talented artists. And he, he had some really troubled times because he was blacklisted. And my stepfather, who was very successful and who was a collector of art, would collect and buy Zero's paintings in order to help support him. Hmm. So I kind of knew Zero from um, just loving him. And I remember when he had a really terrible accident and I went to see him in the hospital. I brought him a pastrami sandwich with a pickle from the stage delicatessen. Mm. You know, I really loved this guy. Uh, and then, you know, I proceeded to have my own career. And then I was really doing quite well. And I had been in this show on Broadway. Um, it was called Poor Murderer. And I had been seen by this very famous director, John Dexter. And John Dexter cast me to be in this show with Zero that was based on The Merchant of Venice. And I was to play the character of Jessica and Zero was to play the part of uh, Shylock. Okay. And it was a thrill. <laughs> Zero, Zero was a great, I mean, I love Zero and the producers. And his, his son, is his son still alive? Is it Josh? Josh, is he still alive? He has two sons, Toby and Josh. Toby is a recluse and wants nothing to do with anybody. Josh is pretty much a recluse now and was, uh, uh, I think now and then he does audition, but he, he also paints. Okay. And, um, but they're both very, Josh is a very eccentric kid and didn't want to have to do with anybody. And, um, you know, it's hard when you have a very famous father, sometimes you turn and hate them and sometimes you love them. And I think with the both boys, they had problems with him. But I loved him. And of course, it was a thrill for me to play his daughter. And uh, then he got very sick. Um, and, uh, and the story is very sad because he, he, he became very ill. They put him in the hospital. This was after our first preview. And um, he, he got something called Kaksaki, Kaksaksi, 
uh, it was a terrible virus and it, and it killed him. Oh. And he was, that was it. We had done one performance with him and we were out of town when it happened in Philadelphia. And uh, we continued with the show and uh, we, they cast uh, this actor who really couldn't carry the show the way Zero could. He wasn't a monumental personality. And so the show play opened on Broadway and it flopped. Okay. Yeah. All right. Another role, you played Mickey Conway in Goodfellas, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, Martin Scorsese. Talk right. about working on that great classic film. Well, that was really, really fun because Marty is such an interesting man. Uh, when he talks to you before you're going to shoot a scene, he speaks to you like an actor. And he gives you something very concrete to do, which is just a thrill, you know, to be around somebody who knows to, to speak to you that way. Because so many directors who get hired, they don't know how to talk that way. But he understands the actor's point of view. And also he let us improvise all the time. So we spent a lot of time improvising and that was just total fun. Okay. So I had a blast. I, I really had a blast on that film and I got cut. <laughs> did you really? No, I didn't have a lucky acting career. Yes, I did. I did get cut. Okay. All right. Well, you were there and that counts for something. I was there and it was great. <laughs> okay. So, Julie, you've done TV, you've done film, and you've done movies. Is there a particular medium of the three that you enjoyed the most? Yes, the theater. Always the theater. I loved that. Okay. And I, I've, I've done TV, film, and, and theater too and theater the one thing that i enjoyed i, I would i'm gonna make this something you probably enjoyed too is that immediate you're right there with the audience type of thing that you don't get with tv and film of course uh, was that the same for you or what was it for you that you, you loved about no, being in the theater absolutely it was the same for me and you know i i did plays all over this uh country and i had the most fun doing plays at the arena stage and i did plays on broadway as you know and I was happiest when I was working in the theater. I was most comfortable when I was working in the theater. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about your paintings, which I told you when we started, absolutely love them. So how, you, as you said, as a child, you were very talented, multi-talented, but what took you to the next level with your painting? Well, that's an interesting story. When I was a kid, I was still trying to decide if I wanted to be a painter for a long time, even when I was in college, I wanted, I, I had a strong impulse to be a painter, but unfortunately I didn't follow that. And, um, and I wanted to say that after I sort of, my career kind of died, I, I started teaching and got a tremendous fulfillment out of teaching. And I taught uh, at UCLA and I taught, I was living for a while in California. I taught for Terry Schreiber Studios for 11 years, but then, you know, I went and followed my passion, which I never followed, which was really my original passion, which was to be a painter. And when I came back from LA in 1999, I said, I'm gonna be a painter. And I began to study and I studied the New York Studio School and I studied the Art Students League and I've studied at the American Academy, American Academy of Art where I'm still studying. And that's when I began to realize my true passion, my dream uh, to be a painter. And since then, my life is completely focused around that um, and just doing that. And I'm lucky enough. Uh, and oh, you know, another interesting thing about my life is that my, my amazing stepfather, he was a collector of, of art and he had an extraordinary collection of art. He had Picasso's, Matisse, um, Kandinsky, uh, Degas, um, he had extra, that was his passion, that was his hobby. So, uh, you know, it had a, a tremendous effect on me being surrounded by all this art all the time. And sometimes I would even meet some of the painters. So I think, you know, it's not, it's strange that you can find yourself at the age of, uh, uh, well, quite much older, you know, uh, in my 60s that I finally found myself and found my passion, uh, which is painting. And uh, so that's what I do now. Um, as a hustler, I'm not good. 
Um, so do I go around to the galleries and hustle? Oh, that was hustle? my next question. That was my next question. Absolutely no, I don't go to the galleries okay. and hustle money. I just do my work. I happen to be lucky that I had the money to be able to do that. And my husband is around and, you know, we can live comfortably and I can pursue my art. So that's what I do. And, you know, I'm still supposed to have that one woman show. Mm -hmm. And hopefully maybe that will happen. Okay. So when a guest comes over and says, I love, I'm the Klimt. I love this painting of yours. Is I it, sell it. Do you sell it or do you give it to them? Or what do you do? No, I've sold, um, okay. I've sold uh, quite a few paintings, but I do it privately. Okay. Okay. And you were talking about studying. I was going to ask you too, as well for the, for the acting side out of curiosity, because you grew up in New York city. Did you study with Lee Strasberg or anybody? I studied with everyone. First, I studied with Sanford Meisner mm -hmm. for two years, and I graduated from the Neighborhood Playhouse. And I was lucky enough to be seen in the production, and I got a very important agent. Then I studied with Lee Strasberg briefly. Um, it was very strange for me to come from Meisner to Strasberg. So I didn't study again with him for quite a while. I didn't stick around with Strasbourg too long. I studied with Stella Adler briefly. Stella Adler didn't like um, beautiful women who, <laughs> students. She was partial to the men. So I didn't stick around with her too long. Then I studied with Bobby Lewis. He was a great teacher, wonderful, wonderful teacher. And I studied with Alan Miller and Warren Robinson. So you see, as I, as I went along having this off-Broadway career and, you know, Broadway career, I was always studying with all of those people all the time. And then I became a member of the Actors Studio, and so I was always studying at the Actors Studio. Okay. When I first contacted you to set up this interview, I mentioned my dad's uncle through marriage. Uh, I don't know how he would, I forget what Debbie told me, how he related to me, but my dad's uncle, Manya, was in our family, Manya Carroll. And his name was Dr. Louis Finger. And Louis was a doctor to um, Eli Wallach and Ann Jackson, his wife, as you know, George Pappard, Carl Malden, Marilyn Monroe, and so on and so on. And when I mentioned him to you, you said you had heard his name before. So I'm just curious, do you, do you remember any stories about Louis Finger at all? No, but I, I think I went to Dr. Finger. Okay. I, I actually think my family went to Dr. Finger for a while because I remembered the name. And I know, and you know, all of our group who lived on the Upper West Side, Zero and Eli and Jack Guilford, well, they lived in the village. But, you know, and also all of the blacklisted writers, um, Ring Lardner and Ian Hunter, we were all friends. Uh, we, were, we all had our social life with them. So we were always hanging around with them. So, of course, we had the same doctors and we had the same everything, you okay. know. So, yes, I remember Dr. Lewis. And then, yeah, and, and he knew your dad. I mean, there were stories that my dad told me that, and they probably were born around the same time and grew up in the same area that uh, your father, John, hung around with, or Louis hung around with John or whoever was older. I don't know, know that part. But I remember the stories. And then when I was doing research on it, I remember some of the stories that my dad told me that Louis told him when he was growing up about your father as well. From that, from that area. And I got on the wall on the other side here, I got a letter um, when my father passed. My father looked a lot like Eli Wallach and they used to stop him on the street, especially in New York. And they thought he was Eli to the point where he's like, yeah, okay, okay, I'm Eli, but can I go now? And Eli hand wrote me, a, wrote a letter and he lived on Riverside uh, in an apartment, I think apartment 803 years ago. And I got the letter framed. And he said, in fact, Louis Finger was our favorite doctor. So like you said, a lot of the same people. Right. Okay. What I would like oh, to talk. By the way, I want you to know that everybody knew my father. Who knew him. Knew him as Julie. Right. Right. Called him Julie. Mm -hmm. And I actually have that in my notes to talk about that. Um, what I want to do is segue into now your dad. I want to read something. So if you if you would let me read this because it's really important to me because I, I hate what they did to your dad and the parallels with Trump and some other things. And I want to first start out with talking about, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but your op-ed, you wrote it on July 5th, 2017. You wrote a riveting op-ed for the New York Times titled Memories of a Real Witch Hunt, which I actually had read that back then. I remember when it came out because at the very end, you talked about Trump in it and about how he likes to throw that around and what he was talking about. Your father endured a witch hunt. Donald Trump endured 
I don't want to go into the whole thing on Trump, but he's enduring what he's guilty of. Your father endured what was really, and others, what was really a witch hunt. So I want to read this because I want to give context for my younger viewers. So give me a little bit to read this, and then I'm going to go into some talking points for you. Great. So first of all, um, the, the article talked about your dad who was subpoenaed in 1951 by the House Un-American Activities Committee. That committee's work was a prelude to the notorious Senate investigations into communists in the government led by the horrible Senator Joseph McCarthy and his counsel, Roy Cohen. Now, I'm going to, a little more to read, but I want to say something on Roy Cohen for my younger viewers. If For the people that are not fans of Donald Trump, in the 80s, Roy Cohen was Donald Trump's attorney. And do your research on this, and you'll find out how evil of an individual Roy Cohen was going way back to the 50s, which Richard Nixon was part of that too. But Roy Cohen was, was part of that. Now, you and I well know, Julie, your father was not a communist. But he declined to name names. Correct? Correct. So far? Okay. Correct. Okay. The experience ruined his career. Even before the House hearing, Hollywood movie studios had barred him from performing in their films. It looks like he didn't work for about 18 months after he was first accused of being a member of the party. Again, was not true. Sadly, and we'll get into this, your father passed away on May 11th of a heart attack on May 11th, 1952, at the young age of only 39. You and your family, my dad included, my dad was about 24 then. I remember Louis Finger telling my dad, your family as well, everybody feels in, in agreement that that caused your father's health problems, absolute distress from it. Um, other thing I want to point out for the people that don't know, your father was a fervent patriot. He tried to listen in World War II, but failed his physical. Instead, he found a way to contribute by organizing with Betty Davis, a club in Los Angeles called the Hollywood Canteen to entertain troops. So far, is that all correct, Joy? That's correct. Okay. The canteen gave service members, many on their way to war, a chance to relax and a reassurance that they had the country's support. He went on a number of tours in the combat zones predating Bob Hope. Exactly. You hear that, viewers? Predating Bob Hope. Not minimizing what Bob Hope did, but predating. Exactly. His father was what was called was, as a patriot. And I served for 20 years and 28 days in the United States Navy. And I appreciate people like your father. And it disgusts me, and we're going to get into this in shortly, what they did to him. And I want, I want people to know that even though it happened all those years ago, it's still a wrong that America did. So when Trump always talks about MAGA, make America great again, who was he making it great for? He didn't make it great for the Garfield family because what they did to your father and other people was not great, okay? What, what they're doing to Jewish people now, minimizing the Holocaust and, and people like Marjorie Taylor Greene putting the star on there for, for not wearing masks like they're person like they're they were uh, in, in the Holocaust that wasn't great for Jews right but what I want what I want to go into with reading that was when you wrote the op-ed and you at the very end talked about Trump and how he likes to throw around witch hunt did you write it well first of all the doc you did a documentary years before about your dad that was shown on um, um, Turner Classic, sure. and, yeah. right? And I know you've you've done you've been interviewed and you've talked about what happened to your dad. So, the first question I want to ask you about the op-ed in particular: Did you write it because you were disgusted that Trump was throwing it around, or were you writing it for to get the record straight for newer generation with your dad and the Trump angle? Everything, both. Okay. But mostly, I was pretty disgusted and pissed off. And I remember seeing the show with. Um, now I've forgotten his name. Uh, I was so angry about Trump and what he was doing and how he, he was using the words witch hunt. I was enraged. And uh, that's why I wrote it. I just said, I've got to get this off of my chest. And uh, that's why. Okay. Powerful op-ed. There was nothing in there that wasn't true. And I'm so happy that you called him out on it because, again, 
what they're doing to him is not a witch hunt. What they're doing to him is what they what they really need to do now, even more so, is bring him to justice because exactly. he's, a, he's a criminal. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Let's um, let's start out like this. Memories of your father for the viewers, if you would share share some memories that come off the top of your head about your father. Well, you know, I do want to tell you an interesting story about okay. uh, my mom. Okay. My, my mother's mother's best friend was killed in the Triangle Fire. Remember when that happened, the Triangle Fire, all of those seamstresses that were working in the building on the on the Lower East Side, and they all were trapped in the building and had to jump to their death. No, I'm not aware of that. I'm not. Oh, Great Triangle Fire. Okay, I'm going to look that up. Oh, it was a horrible tragedy. This uh, terrible thing that happened made my mother into quite an activist. And she rallied for unions, for labor unions, because they didn't have them in that time. So she was a political person. And I think that because of that, my father suffered later for her political activities. My mother was briefly a member of the Communist Party. I think she lasted about a month and then gave birth to her first child and then that was over. She just didn't have time for that. And so she you know, became busy raising uh, children. But when the committee went after my father, they did something really disgusting because they tried to go after my mother through my father. And they tried to make my father say that my mother had been a member of the Communist Party. And you know what? She had been a member of the Communist Party for about a minute, you know? Uh, but they used that against him. And they asked over and over for him to, stu to stool on my mother about that and to stool on his friends. And obviously he wasn't gonna do that. So uh, that's, uh, you know, that wasn't his way of living in the world. And it's not, you know, he didn't believe in that. He had, he had a great um, idea about what honor was and, and respecting your country. So um, that's the story of, of that. Uh, my father was uh, very funny and very flirtatious and very seductive and um, everything, you, you know, you could want in a guy. You know, uh, he wanted to better himself intellectually always because he never had a college degree and it always felt like he wasn't good enough because of that. And um, he was a kidder, you know, he was, uh, people loved my father. He was the kindest person. You couldn't meet anybody kinder than my father. And uh, I don't know, you know, I, 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 that's, that's what I remember about him. That's what everyone remembers about him how good he was to everybody. And he was a fervent anti-racist. So he insisted on hiring Canada Lee mm -hmm. to be in Body and Soul with him. And the studio said, well, we're not gonna do the film if you use a black man. And he said, well, I'm not gonna do the film if I don't, you know? So that's the kind of guy he was. And that was very important to him, a, a fervent anti-racist. And that's why he made movies like that too. Um, where he was uh, also insisted that Juan o. Hernandez be in the, that great film he did, The Breaking Point. Mm -hmm. um, and Juan o. Hernandez was a, uh, a uh, Black and Hispanic actor, great actor. So that was my father. Um, what do I remember of him is that he called me character. <laughs> and I didn't know what that meant, but character means everything that makes somebody very different and exciting is a character. When you're studying acting and you wanna know what a character is, that, you know, well, what makes a person a character? You know, what makes them special and different from everybody else? And uh, so he called me a character. Okay. And I was a character. <laughs> okay. Do you know by chance through maybe obviously through, through your mom, did your dad have a favorite role that he played? That I, I can't tell you, but I, I would imagine, um, you know, that would be hard to answer because I can't ask him that question. But if you were to ask me that question, I would say that the, the truth of an actor is how he can make a change, make a huge transition between one thing and another. And in Body and Soul, 
He starts out as an innocent, tough kid, you know, from the streets. Then he turns into a, a, a ferocious, ambitious, I don't care about anybody, but making money kind of a guy with no conscience. And then he grows up and becomes a mensch, you know? So um, I, I would think that daddy would have liked that one the best because he made that huge, you know, transition from one kind of a human being to another kind of a human being. And I think he would be the proudest of that. Okay. Yeah. Who changed his name from Garfinkel to Garfield? Oh, that was Jack Warner. Okay. He said, we can't call you Garf, you know, we can't call you. I mean, he called himself Jules Garfinkel in the theater. He, he, did, he didn't call himself John, he called himself Jules Garfinkel. First he was Julius Garfinkel, then he was Jules Garfinkel. But when he went to Hollywood, Jack Warner said, well, I can't, we can't call you that, you know, we can't call you Garfinkel. I'm gonna call you James Garfield. And my father said, wait a minute, he was a president. He was assassinated. I don't want that name. <laughs> um, and he said, well, I think my father said, well, what about John? How about John? Or, or maybe Jack Warner said it, but anyway, they came to the conclusion of John Garfield. So that's how that happened. Okay. So now, I always knew that anybody who didn't know my father called him John. If you knew my father, you'd say, how's Julie? Mm -hmm. But if they said, how's John? I'd say, ah, oh, he didn't know my father. Okay. And I have a note here about Julie, like you said, everybody called him Julie. So obviously, was that his choice or your mom's choice to name you Julie? Ah, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I was named after a great aunt named Julie. But, um, you know, in the Jewish religion, you're not supposed to name somebody the same name as the person that's alive, because it's supposed to be not lucky. And so for a long time, I felt like I was not lucky I didn't make luck for my father. Why did he leave me? Why was I named Julie? You know, and, uh, but then I found out, of course, that I was named after an aunt. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Story. Crazy story. Yeah. Um, do you know about my father hitching across the country when he was a kid? No, but please tell me the okay. story. Well, my father decided that he wanted to make it in Hollywood after he'd been studying with the guys at the theater lab and everything. And he went to my mother who he had fallen in love with. And he said, I'm gonna try to go to Hollywood and make my way in Hollywood. And she, he said, I've got to follow my dream. And she said, by all means, you should follow your dream. But the thing was that they were in love with each other already. And all right, so he went off with a friend of his and he hitched on the freight trains and he made his way across the country on riding the freight trains and picking fruit. And that's, and that's how he made his living. He would hang out with the hobos and he would pick food and he would get back on the freight trains. And then he, got, he finally got to California. And when he got to California, he realized he wasn't gonna make it that way. He wasn't going to succeed that way. He wasn't going to be able to break through. So, and he also got arrested once and thrown in jail <laughs> on one of these, uh, you know, adventures of his. And so he decided to come back. And of course, he had to hitch his way back because he didn't have any money. So he rode the freight trains, he hung out with the bombs. And unfortunately, he caught rheumatic fever. Oh, wow. And by the time he came back to Manhattan, he had a uh, hundred and uh, something fever. He was on death's door. He had caught rheumatic fever and he was in the hospital and he was dying. Hmm. And um, it looked like he, he was going to die. He didn't die. But his heart was forever damaged because of that. So that made him a candidate for a major heart attack if something were to emotionally push him over the edge with the black, which is what the blacklist did. Um, and, you know, and because of that trip that he had and those adventures that he had, they made a movie. A I was just going to say that. I was just going to say Travels. that. Sullivan's Travels. That was inspired by Julie's stories that he would tell up in the, when they would go and sit up in the, uh, in the dining rooms and hang out when they were making films at Warner Brothers. He would okay. tell these stories and that's how that movie was. But there, you know what? That's actually what, there was another movie. I don't know. Wasn't that he made a movie in the in the maybe the late thirties? I can't think of the actress's name. Patricia, the Patricia something. What was I can't remember if he was a hobo in it or if he was traveling on the train and he came to the town. I, I saw it like two years ago. 
Put, Must be my Priscilla destiny. Lane, Priscilla Lane, maybe was yeah, in it. Yeah, be my destiny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wasn't that kind of? Um, did he yes. travel on a, on, a, on a train on that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. That was a good movie. That was a yeah. good movie. <laughs> yeah, it was. Okay. We well, we mentioned Body and Soul, and me being a boxing guy, I, last year I got inducted into the Florida Boxing Hall of Fame. So I I got to talk about Body and Soul because it's my favorite boxing movie of all time. I hate that they remade it. Uh, I, they should have never touched it, but Hollywood seems to do that these days. But what I want to talk about, well, first of all, I want to give it its props for the viewers. Francis Lyon and Robert Parrish won the Academy Award for Best Film Editing for the movie. Your father was up for, was nominated for Best Actor in a Leading Role. And Abraham Polanski was nominated for Best Writing Original Screenplay for a boxing movie. Now, that's, that's pretty good. And that was in 1947. And the movie still holds up all these years later. But what I want to talk about, something interesting about that film. Your father was part of um, the Enterprise Studios. And for the viewers, that was an independent production company co-founded by actor John Garfield, alongside producers David L. Lowe and Charles Enfield. It looks like in 1946, after your father's contract with Warner Brothers had expired. Is that sound about correct? That's absolutely correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now it says, having recently turned freelance, the idea was your father for an outlet in obtaining creative control over his own projects, as well as encouraging fellow filmmakers to pursue their own humanistic um, advocacies through their work. Body and Soul was with that production company, was it not? Yes. And that, by the way, is one of the things that got my father blacklisted in the first place and got the studios to turn against him because in those days, you did not produce your own movies. If you were an actor and you were with a studio, you did not do that. It was a no-no. And the studios were so threatened by that and so against him because he did that, that they, um, now it came down to my mother that uh, there was a meeting during the blacklist and there were three actors that they were looking at to crucify. One, was, and they were Jewish. One was Danny Kay. Mm -hmm. One was Edward G. Robinson, and one was Julie. And those three actors had very liberal points of view about life and, you know, and activism and, um, uh, you know, uh, everything that we want to happen in this world. All right, anti-racism, okay? Mm -hmm. So, of course, they picked Julie because Julie started his own production company. He was the only actor besides Charlie Chaplin and Mary Pickford who started his own production company and they were very threatened by that. And that really did him in because they said, let's pick Julie, let's, let's offer him up for the sacrifice. And that's what happened. So they did not stand up for him when he was blacklisted. And then the Screen Actors Guild didn't stand up for him either. They just let it happen. In fact, they helped it along. So let, let me ask you a question and you, you may know this or you may not know the answer to this. And I've only seen old reels, you know, when they, they used to play the reels in the movie, not during my time, but they, I've seen them on TV, the old reels in the movie, in the movie theaters in between movies. Bogart and a couple other people, they had that footage of them, they're marching down, they're going to do this, that, and the other. But if I recall correctly, they marched, but they didn't, and I could be wrong, I don't want to, I don't want to put bad information, but they marched, but did they do anything? Um, do you, you remember know, Julie, that footage? Julie was not in that. No, no, he wasn't, but Bogey and him. He, he flew to meet up with them. So okay. he wasn't in the photograph, and he didn't get credited for that. Did they do anything? No, but they tried to do okay. something. But they were up against uh, Ronald Reagan, and they were up against very right-wing people and the committee and, you know, the whole thing. I, I just don't think they had a shot in hell to, to, uh, to defeat that thing that was going on. It, it was just horrible. I mean, it wasn't just actors who got blacklisted. It was teachers also. I, I have a friend who's a great artist whose father, his father was where they put a hose on him, a water hose on him in order to, to get him out of the school because he, he had some um, liberal views. 
Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, this was, they couldn't really do anything. They were up against the, the monster of the studio, you know, and the monster of McCarthy and his friends and Roy Cohn and all of them. Okay. In your opinion, knowing what your father went through um, and all these years later with Trump and, and not just Trump alone with the Republican party, the way it is with the insanity of it, at least I feel that we could see this all over again in this country. What do you think? Absolutely. You know, Brad, it's really incredible to meet you and you're so, uh, you know so much about uh, what went down and it's just wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, you know, you're so soulful. And yes, you're right. And yes, I'm, I'm horrified and scared. I mean, all of us are. We're, we're, we're so scared. Yeah. We, we see our democracy crumbling, mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, we listen to a man like Ari Melber, you know, or we listen to, you know, the show with, um, he's so wonderful. What's his name? He has the show at night, um, a man, oh, he's so funny. Um, and I can't remember his name, but uh, you know, you know that there are so many great people who are against this. And yet this Republican party, I mean, what are they doing? Yeah. It's, 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 it's madness. Listen, I don't know what happened today. I hope that uh, Letitia James, uh, what did she do? What did, uh, yeah, I don't know. I got to look, I got to look into it. Cause I've been, I was preparing for the show, but the whole stuff with the, I mean, there's so many cases against this guy. It's like <laughs> every day. It's like, you know, we used to have 24 hour news cycles. Now it's like 24 seconds. It's on to the next and the next. And, exactly. and it comes out with this, these insane statements I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's the worst form of propaganda I, I think I've ever seen. It's just- it's And, and watching um, Fox News. Oh, I, I, know, I can't, I can't. Fox News. Yeah, they're traitors. Julie, they're traitors to a, to a country. Out of curiosity, I know, I know your father sadly passed when you were so young, but if you're, and I don't know if you can answer this question, but I still want to ask it. If your father was, was alive today, and, and I've, I've been asked this about my father because my father- was in the civil rights. He marched with King. He, he fought against Anita Bryant in the seventies. I have to send you a clip of him when he took on Anita Bryant on Miami beach, when she was fighting against gay people. Um, and he was, he was out there. If, if your father was around today, seeing the Republican party and seeing Trump, what do you think? What do you, how do you think oh, he'd be? God, he'd be horrified. He'd yeah. be, he'd be doing everything in, in, in possible to stop it. Okay. That's what he'd be doing. All right. One more question I want to ask you about your dad. If you wanted Hollywood or, or film historians or, or whatever, even from a humanitarian side of your father, because there was a whole, a whole side of him that was beautiful on top of his beautiful acting, what would be the one or two things you would like people to remember when they say the name John Garfield? Oh, wow. Wow. Um. I, I guess you'd have to say that he was a man who who uh, really believed in in what this country was supposed to be. Um, you know uh, that it was supposed to be free for everyone, that there would be no racism, that there would be no uh, anti-Semitism, or you know th that none of that would exist, and, and that everyone would have a shot. Um, I American think American dream. I, yeah. It's just, where, where has that gone? I know. What's going on? You know, I mean, he would be horrified. Yeah. And he, I'm sure that my father would have done everything in his, in his power to have pushed that forward. You know, I, I'm sure he would have if, if he had been alive today. Okay. Before we segue into the second part, the random fun questions, there's no right or wrong answers. I do okay. want to say this. I do want to say this for the viewers and to you. I have a hashtag on, on Twitter that I use and it's called, it's hashtag moving humanity forward. That's my goal in life every day in the smallest act of kindness or whatever it is to continue to move humanity forward. And I want you to know as someone that adored your father's acting, I do not know him personally, but I do have that connection with Dr. Finger and my dad, um, that when I watch his performances today, he moved humanity forward because he, he sadly left us at the age of 39, but in, in 52, but all these years later, we're still talking about his body of work. And I do want to give you credit for something because I watched a scene and you're absolutely right. You were doing it. Might've been 
uh, Turner Classic or one of those shows, and they were paying, they were playing one of my favorite movies, The Postman Always Rings Twice. And you said, watch my father when she when Lana Turner comes out, she's got the thing on and she's va 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 boom, right? And your father does this thing, and boy, that was a nice piece of acting. He he almost goes jelly, and he leans uh-huh. against the counter, and he's right. like, you know, you can tell he's like, wow, but he doesn't <laughs> let her really know, you know what I mean? Where she was trying to take yeah. control, he really was, as we say, eating the scenery up, chewing the scenery right. up, because he that was a fantastic piece of acting, and you pointed that out, and I want you to know, I I've seen that many many times. And I always see that little thing that he does. And I'm so glad you brought that out. Oh, it's wonderful. That's such a great moment. Absolutely. And that's, and that's another great moment. We can talk moment. about that in the next sequence, if you want. Yeah, you, you know what? Cover- Let's talk about what? that now. Go ahead. Oh, well, yeah, go ahead. Let's right, talk so, about that. You know, when you're an actor, you find ways to, to express what you think you're feeling. Maybe it's like an animal would feel. You know, when you watch an animal how an animal is so intuitive and, and, uh, and, and uh, can be so uh, ferocious, mm-hmm. you know? And, uh, and I always, and you know, when actors like daddy, you know, are working, they're thinking about those things. They're thinking, is this guy, is, is he smelling her? Is he um, a mad, you know, is he, he's breathing and he's like a ferocious kind of tiger that wants to spring and, you know, eat that Lana Turner alive, you mm-hmm. know, from the foot to the top of her beautiful, gorgeous head, right? And then he, he, but he doesn't want her to know that mm-hmm. because he's got to play the game right that she's going to want him. Yep. So he goes for it and then he stops himself and he, he collapses into himself physically, which was a very interesting move that he made. And it was almost as if he, he stopped himself from springing on her. You know, he knew he was gonna, if he was gonna get her, he was gonna have to get play the game her way, mm-hmm. that he was gonna have to pull back. And yeah. then he, he does, and he takes this breath, you know, and he just pulls back. And that is such a great moment. Mm-hmm. This is like so connected to his physicality, to his breathing, and so subtle. Out of curiosity, did you ever meet anybody attached to that film? Uh, did I ever meet anybody? No, I I didn't. But I did meet somebody who I hate to tell you this, but uh, a friend of Julie's who was at his house, and uh, Julie, uh, you know, and Lana had a lot of chemistry between them, and he Julie was very immature, and he told me that Julie he was at Julie's house when Julie came home. And he and Julie walked in and said to him, I can't believe it, I just fucked Lana Turner. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, you know, I hope he didn't say that in front of my mother. I don't think he did say that in front of my mother. And I know that they did. Oh, wow. Uh, they did, but, and it was awful, <laughs> awful. You know how it is you think you're gonna make love with somebody and it's gonna be so great and then you do it and it's, they don't smell right and it doesn't taste <laughs> right and it's awful and you think it was going to be so great and it's, well apparently that's how it was oh lord so it was a disaster <laughs> okay and um, i think he learned a big lesson well she got it Lana, it's not me talking out of class Lena turner got around from johnny stampanata to to sinatra to all i mean she was she got busy with a lot of people <laughs> well why not you know why not i mean the truth you know a woman today she can be that way now, but in those days you couldn't no. be that. Way. Double well, standard. Come on. What do you think I did when I was a young, gorgeous knockout in the seventies? <laughs> what do you think I was doing? It was like life was a pastry uh, <laughs> store full of delicious cake. You know, I went to. I used to go to Max's Kansas City. I'll have that today. And you know, I'll, I'll have that one. He's nice and tall and beautiful. I'll take this one. He's a famous painter. I mean, that's. It was like a. It was like a goodie shop. And you know, it was that way. It wasn't allowed to be that way for women. Right. It was that way for men, and they were allowed to be. Now we're. Well, it's a double standard. It was. A, it was a woman right. was was a whore, and a man was a stud. It's a double standard. Exactly. It's a right. double standard. I mean, it, it and it and actually, it's it's kind of like this. Well, it's changed a little bit today, but still, they look down. Women get crucified. It's the 
And, you know, that's that's you know, we talked about Trump earlier. That's why I don't understand how women can run behind this guy because he's a misogynistic, narcissistic pig. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's segue, like I said, into the random fun questions. Whatever okay. you answer off the top of your head is it. Okay. So it, it, I may know the answer to this already, but I'm still going to ask you, who is your favorite actor? Who do you think? John I know Cox? who it is. How about, okay. <laughs> yeah, but you know what? Some people might say, I love my dad, but it's actually, but that's okay. It's not about it. What is your fa favorite role then? Favorite role of your dad's? Well, body and soul, because he makes that change. He makes the transition between one thing and another. It's a huge, it's a huge leap to go from being a, a tough, immature, stupid kid to being a man who doesn't sell out and risks his life for his integrity. You know, uh, yeah. that's a great, that's great acting. So sure is, say, hey, sure was. Yeah. Okay. Do you have a favorite musical band? A favorite musical band? What would I think of as my favorite? That's very hard. I mean, you know, I, uh, gosh, I don't know. I, 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 I love Taylor Swift. Okay. I love musical band. I love the Beatles. Um, I'm kind of old fashioned. Uh, I certainly love it. A lot of Ed Sharon. what's coming to my mind. But I don't think I have one favorite thing, and I also okay. love classical music. Okay, so, oh, you name three. That's fine. Yeah. Do you have a favorite or fondest memory of a concert you ever went to see? Oh, my God. Oh, of a concert? Oh, God. That's, uh, that's, uh, oh, God. I, there's so many that come to my mind right now. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, well, uh, I went to Carnegie Hall a lot, and um, I saw Leonard Bernstein conduct. Mm -hmm. Do I remember each one specifically? No, but, um, you know, I love classical music, and um, I, I don't remember which one it was, but it, it was a thrill to see him okay. conduct. Okay. Yeah, legendary. So, legendary. He's, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this, when you answer, this could go back or it could be modern day. It's, it's totally up to you. Yeah, I know it's hard with the question favorite, but who do you listen to or who did you have, who have you listened to male singer that you like, that you enjoy hearing? It's funny right now. I'm thinking about Billie Holiday a lot because okay. you want to see a favorite is one of my favorite and Ella Fitzgerald and a male singer. God, there's so many. I mean, I, I like it. Sharon. I like, I love uh, John Mayer. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it would be, it would be, uh, it's so hard to answer this question because there's so much music that I love. Okay. Um, uh, and I can't think of it all. I'd have to look at my, my list. I have such a long <laughs> list. And, you know, when I paint, I love to listen to, um, there's, not, there's some new music that I don't like at all, but um, I love, and I love classical music too. Okay. Um, so that's, I just love music in general. I love jazz, I love Cars, Silver, Salonius Monk. Okay, love to listen all to that great. Stuff. Okay. I, I have a passion for music. Okay. So so, I drive my husband nuts. I mean, okay. I love Gloria Stefan. I love, uh, you know, I, I love all kinds of music. You're diverse. I used to Larry Harlow. I was a friend of his. Okay. So, so everything. Okay. <laughs> so out of, out of curiosity, being a New Yorker and loving yeah. music and loving painting, have you ever seen any, have you ever met Tony Bennett or seen any of his paintings up close? Um, yes, I've seen his paintings. He was okay. Okay. Um, he didn't have uh, the madness of a great painter in him. I thought he was a good singer. It, it wasn't my kind of a thing, actually, his kind of singing. I never really went for it. I wasn't a Sinatra freak. It, oh, it just wasn't, that's I, sacrilegious. I, I know. I just <laughs> Now I actually appreciate Sinatra okay. much more than I did in the old days. Okay. And I do. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. I'm the biggest Sinatra fan. That's why I said sacrilege. Well, but you said you appreciate him now, though. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I do. Do you have a favorite noise or sound you like to hear? Oh, my God. What a question. It probably would have something to do with food. <laughs> with food? <laughs> Anything to do with food is my favorite thing. <laughs> Uh, maybe it would be the sound of food being ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I don't okay. know if I have a favorite sound, but I do love, um, all I do is think of food. You want okay. to hear what my favorite thing is in the world? Food is my favorite thing. <laughs> Which actually, that is one of my questions, but before that, I'm going to flip it on you. <laughs> do you have a least favorite noise or sound? Oh, yes, the sound of the ambulances in New York City and the fire engines just kills me and it hurts so much. It's painful to hear it. Okay. Hey. Okay. Yes, I love the sound of cats meowing. Okay. I love cats. Okay. Yeah. Now, you just said food. It's probably going to be an impossible question to answer, but do you have a favorite food or all of it? <laughs> everything. everything. I love everything. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not a sushi fan, but I love everything else. And I'm a great cook. Okay. And, uh, I really am a great cook. And I can make, if I want to learn something, uh, my husband and I have been home a lot and I've learned a lot of things because, uh, you know, you, you can't go out. So um, we've learned how to cook. He's become a, a wonderful cook too. But of course I love Italian food, mm -hmm. you, you know, but I love all kinds of food. I love um, Indian food. I love um, uh, uh, what else do I love? Uh, I, I would say that um, Italian food is probably my favorite. You know, I, uh, my absolute favorite. I love bread. I love pastries. Okay, so let me ask you a foodie question. When I bring yeah. Debbie, when, when I bring Debbie back to New York to see my remaining crew that I have left there, where can I go in New York City and get some decent matzo ball soup and a good corned beef sandwich? You know, that's a very difficult uh, question for me I to bet. answer. Things are tough in the restaurant business in New yeah. York. And um, there's a lot of restaurants that have closed. And I mean, I would have originally said go to the Carnegie, you know, but there is no Carnegie anymore. Oh, geez. The Carnegie's gone, the Carnegie Deli. Um, and uh, I do know the Pastrami Queen has good corned beef and pastrami. They're on 72nd Street on the east side too. Okay. But I think my favorite is the Second Avenue Deli. Okay. Uh, they're not on, they're not downtown now, but they have very, I would go there, but it's not okay. a fancy restaurant. Okay. It's just very good food. Um, and, uh, but you know, the restaurant business is very iffy right now. Right. And we don't know what's going to happen with it. Right. Um, and uh, a lot of my favorite places I haven't gone back to yet because we really haven't gone anywhere. Right. You know, so I try to make the stuff myself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember what your very first job was? My very first job was working at Capizio's. Uh, I, it used to be, you know, where they sell dance clothing. Okay. I worked there and I sold uh, shoes and ballet costumes. Okay. I remember Capizio shoes. Yeah. Yeah. In the village. Okay. That was my first job, yeah. Okay. You and your husband pre-COVID. Yeah. Do you have a favorite vacation destination? Yes. I'm going to go to the Cayman Islands or go to um, the the ocean. Uh, the um, Not the Cayman Islands, the Turks and Caicos. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Love to do that. Okay. If you could meet one person from any time in history, dead or alive, any walk of life, who would you like to meet? And what would either be your first question or some talking points for that person? Oh my God, that's so hard to answer. I mean, I can think of several people. But I really would love to meet Rembrandt. I really would. Okay. Um, uh, he's the greatest genius. And, um, but this is so hard too, because I'd love to talk to George Clooney about making a movie about Julie. And I think he's the only person who could. So, okay. you know, this is like, it's a very difficult question to answer. Okay. Yeah. All right. If you were to hit the big, big lottery for two, 200 million, 300 million, $400 million, what's the first thing you're going to do? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, well, the first thing I do is I would buy everybody I love a house. Okay. That's the first thing I would do. And I'd buy myself a, a big house on the ocean. And I would take some of that money, quite a bit of it, and give it to people who are hungry, by the way. And, um, and I would go to uh, 
Paris and I would go back to Paris. I've never been to the Louvre since it's new. I would go to the National Gallery in England. I would stay at all the finest hotels and I would all I would go to see the Van Gogh Museum. Uh, I would like to see the tulips in Amsterdam. That's what uh, I want to go on a safari. Okay. Oh, so badly. And I'm dying to go to Morocco. Okay. I wish I had the money to do these things. Okay. I don't. <laughs> All right. Okay. If you had to sum yourself up in a few thoughts, Julie, as a human being, what would you say? I'd say that they, you know what they say about me? That I'm hilarious, incredibly kind and considerate, insane, <laughs> very, very, um, mercurial you know in the sense of i can i can lose my temper very dramatic oh you know sometimes and very lovable that's what i would say uh, and and quite neurotic <laughs> <laughs> okay. she loves me she lives for food that's me <laughs> okay and final question do you have a saying you live your life by and if so what is it Oh, saying thank you. Okay. Saying thank you. It's very important. Saying thank you. It sure is. Yeah. And it, you know something today? So many people don't do it. You yeah. hold the door for somebody, they don't say thank you. You, they, you go in a restaurant, they don't say thank you. I'm like, really? What, when do we get away from saying thank you? Something so, so I don't, easy to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. I want to... I want to give you a couple thoughts and then I want to give you back the microphone to close. Oh, before I do that, for the viewers, what are your social media platforms? Oh, I'm on Instagram as Julie Garfield Mintz because my husband's name is Mintz. And I actually, it's just kind of strange because I, uh, when my best friend, he tried to help me go on Instagram, he said, Julie Garfield actress. I said, oh, I don't want to be Julie Garfield actress. He said, well, why don't you be Julie Garfield artist? And I said, oh, I don't want to be Julie Garfield artist. You know, I'm not experienced enough. I'll be Julie Garfield Mintz. So um, I, I know it's crazy, but I saw, I never use Julie Garfield Mintz except on Instagram. And on my website, I'm just juliegarfield.com. And on Facebook, I'm Julie Garfield. Okay. And that's it. I, I don't go on Twitter anymore. Um, I sort of got afraid of it and didn't do very well with it. Um, cause I don't think I'm so great at those, uh, things, but anyway, uh, the reason I like Instagram is cause it's so visual. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you for coming on today. I a wanna, pleasure. Uh, thank you. And I want to tell you, like I said, your father to this day still means something to a lot of people, including me. He moved humanity forward by his performances, by his stances. And as I'm an only child. And my other thing is keeping my father's memory alive, which I'm going to do until the day I leave. So I appreciate when I see um, children of, and it, your, your dad happens to be famous, but even children of people that aren't famous, keeping their parents' memories alive, especially when it's important because they had such an impact on humanity. And your father did. Your father did. And, and I wanted to have you on because... I hate what was done to him, like so many other people. Um, sadly, a lot of people are gone now that feel this way. And a, a new generation is introduced to him. But I want to introduce the newer generation to what's factual so they understand. And I also, like you said earlier, want them to understand is what happened to your dad in, nine, in, in the 50s could happen again today and a lot yeah. easier today than it happened in the 1950s because they go after people on social media and different things that they didn't have before. So it's important right. that your dad's story and what was done to him is told. So I thank you for coming on. I want to give you the mic to close out. Any closing thoughts, anything you want to say? Well, you've made it very easy and very pleasant and wonderful. I, I, I don't normally like to do a lot of these things anymore. And I, I just want you to, to know that it's been a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you're you. You're a lovely too. man. Lovely man. Thank you. And 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 it, you what you're doing is a mitzvah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hey folks. That's another episode of the Bad Brad Berkwood Show on the Ringside Report Web TV channel. Now don't forget 
to hit that button and subscribe. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter at BadBradRSR. Again, it's at BadBradRSR. Julie Garfield. I knew from straight emails with her and watching clips of her doing research, which you see, I do a lot of research for my guests because I want a true 360 interview. But I knew that she was going to be a fantastic guest, humanitarian, keeping the memory of her legendary father, one of my favorite actors, truly is, John Garfield alive. Those are the type of guests I'm going to have on my show, moving humanity forward. That's my goal till I depart this earth, and whichever way I go. <laughs> even though I have this camera, which I'm only getting halfway. But that's okay, even if that's the case. I'll work my way up to the top somehow. Moving humanity forward. All right, folks, remember, every act of kindness is a little love we leave behind. Bad Brad out. Thank you for watching the Bad Brad Berkwood Show. Please follow, subscribe, leave comments, forget about it, and move humanity forward.